My name is Colin O'Hanson. On Black Friday, November 29, 2002, I went running by the river after work. For the three months prior, I'd been doing this at least twice a week, having signed up to run the Dallas White Rock Half Marathon in mid-December. My schedule actually put me behind because three runs a week had been recommended to me if I wanted to increase my endurance. What I lacked in repetitions, I made up in distance, easily able to run 10 miles without getting too winded. What began as a personal challenge turned into a kind of therapy for me. I had read that long distance running was good for your brain and it really did help me to clear my head. And as a ginger who couldn't tan, my face would light up like a Christmas tree after an intense run. I also worked at an Adidas outlet store, so I figured I should be in the know about what I was selling. I was so often asked about it, seven hours a day, five days a week. That night, Black Friday, we stayed open late. We'd planned to close shop at 9 p.m., but with the holiday discount sales, the customers seemed to just endlessly file in. And once in, they seemed to linger interminably, weighing the pros and cons of owning every item in the shop. It was only me, Alice, and Sean shutting up the shop that night, the other sales reps leaving at staggered times over the course of the evening. Sean and Alice were quietly whispering to one another about someone who wouldn't leave the changing rooms, concealing laughter at the awkwardness of the situation. My last customer was an older woman who had taken an incredibly long time to decide upon the right four pairs of sneakers for her grandchildren. I helped her load the boxes into her cart and began to shut the roller doors. Alice had finally found the courage to usher the man out of the changing room and make that final sale of the evening. It's funny the details that suddenly seem important when you try to get your mind around a significant event. So I didn't end up getting to my usual riverside track until quite late, sometime around 10.30 p.m. Despite the time of night, I was adamant about clocking in some distance. I hadn't been running that week and feared falling behind. Plus, I knew it would be good for me. Usually, the riverside track was a busy part of a busy town, so I rarely, if ever, saw the same people running, riding their bikes, walking their dogs and on the rare occasion sitting by the river taking in the view. But not this evening, not this late. It was far too dark to enjoy any city view the river normally presented. I passed maybe two people around the start of the track as I began to jog down the path. I'd been pacing myself for about 20 minutes, about two and a half miles, when I heard something coming up behind me. An extra set of steps and the swishy sound of tracksuit pants. The sounds echoed as the track curled underneath a wide bridge. I took advantage of an upcoming bend to shoot a casual glance behind me, and yes, there was in fact someone else out running this late. I didn't recognize him as one of the two people I'd seen at the start of my run. This man was quite tall, dressed in one of those marathon running singlets with a number on it. 117 or 113, I think. I could tell his shirt was quite old, perhaps a find at a Goodwill store. Even in the dim light of the street lamps under the bridge, I could make out a few rips in discoloration. He also wore gray tracksuit pants and a faded brown-orangey cap. I thought nothing of it at the time, though his outfit wouldn't have been what I would have thrown on to go for a run. When I came back around the loop a mile later and under the bridge again, I heard the same swoosh of tracksuit pants and light footsteps. Another look back showed me that the same tall man was still behind me. Was he doing the same loop as me? Was he pacing himself at eight-minute miles like me? It felt strange this late at night, and especially, as I said before, since I never usually see the same people. If I were him, I would change up my route so as not to scare someone or give them the wrong impression, only because it had become so secluded and so late. Surely he saw that I had noticed him and was showing concern. 
It was at that point that I made an impulsive decision, doing something I never do mid-run, which was to stop completely. I knew there'd be a water fountain in around 50 meters that I could take a drink at if I needed to seem unfazed by his presence. So out of curiosity, I slowed my jog to a walk, panting, my hands on my hips, back straight to allow oxygen into my lungs and waited for the man to pass me. And he did. He didn't glance back at me, just kept running around the bend and out of sight. As he did this, I noticed that he was running strangely. His footsteps were, for the most part, quiet as he ran on the tips of his toes. His swooshing pants, though, betrayed any hopes of stealth. I thought that was so odd. When a few seconds had passed since I had seen him, I let out a, a small laugh of relief. Keeping to my fake plan, I continued walking to the water fountain, splashed my face, and began working my way up a very steep slope my workmate Alice called No Hope Slope. It was incredibly steep, and for an extra challenge, we would try and sprint it. But I was yet to be able to conquer it in full. I told myself when I reached the top, I would resume my jog again. I had stopped for less than a minute, but when I started running again, funnily enough, I did not catch up to the runner in the marathon singlet. I picked up the pace even more so, trying to spot any sign of him, looking up high along the highway roadside above and down by the river's edge, but nothing. I concluded that he must have gone off the track and reflected on my mild paranoia about the whole evening. As I said, I didn't usually run at night, and it was probably spooking me more than it normally would had the sun been up. I decided on one final loop to try to finish my run. This time, when I came back around, approaching the bridge, I uncannily heard the man for a third time. He seemed much closer to me. I turned around to look, and to my shock, the man, 200 feet or so behind me, had broken out into a full-on sprint towards me. I stumbled as a small gasp escaped my mouth, and I ran. I ran and ran and ran until finally the space under the bridge wound around near the end, to the place in the path where I could take relief, being an eye shot of the cars on the busy street above. However, at this point, I did not think I could make it all the way up that steep slope into the safe public space because I was just so worn out. Instead, I took advantage of my surroundings and decided to hide. There were a lot of nooks and crannies that strayed off the track in the area under the bridge. I saw an opening up a small path, much less of an incline than no hope slope, so I took it hiding behind a large tree. I was exhausted, out of breath. The area was about 30 feet off the main running track, a small patch of about six or seven trees and an old bench that faced the river. From this vantage point, I could see down to the running track for around uh, a half-mile radius. I tried to calm my panting, swallowing in a dry throat as I crouched, peeking carefully down the running track. When I think back to this night, I cannot count how many times I'd initially felt scared, then tried to laugh it off or tell myself I was just being spooked by the dark. For some reason, it was never enough for me to just turn around and go home. I wish to God that I'd done so in this moment, because what I saw next really did prove to me that this man was not just a late-night runner. This man was in pursuit of me. I could see him now from my viewpoint. He strayed from the track like a car doing snakes on a dirt road. He went down along the shoreline by the river, turning his head back and forth, jumping behind pillars sporadically, expecting to find me hiding there, I presumed. No, I knew. He was looking for me. From where I was, I was able to observe that strangeness in his jog. He ran on his tiptoes like he was trying not to make a noise. But there was always that loud swishing from his tracksuit pants. He was right under a cluster of street lamps now, his orange cap pushed down low, covering his face. At first glance, I thought his shoes were old dress shoes, but a closer look showed 
two large Velcro strips folded across each foot. The way he ran looked so uncomfortable, yet so consistent. Who could keep it up for that long, and why was he looking for me? After he'd searched in all possible hiding spots along the main track, he started running up the smaller path I'd taken that led into pitch black darkness where I was hiding. My heart flipped over in my chest. Like an adult playing hide and seek, had he pretended to look everywhere else before looking for me here? He was getting closer, looking in my direction. I turned back around the tree and stood up, ready to make a run for it. From my left, he ran past me and started darting around the other trees, continuing his search. He even looked upwards to see if I'd climbed a tree. It was much darker in this space, and I could probably have moved without being seen, but I was paralyzed with fear, afraid to make a move lest he should hear me and dart after me. He didn't seem tired at all. What happened next? This is the part I, I can't seem to shake. When the runner had finished searching my small cluster of trees, he turned around to run back down the path where he'd come from. This meant he would run right towards me. I found it in me to slowly curl around the tree, with my hands wrapped behind me, around the trunk. I heard the man coming towards me, starting back down the path again. And this is when it happened. My body was facing the river now, my head turned to the right, looking for the moment when he might pass me. And then he came, jogging past. There was a split second where he actually looked me in the eyes. He looked at me. The expression on his face was sheer determination, like he was trying to win a race. It was also intentional, like he was anticipating, finally catching me, like he believed he really would find me. But for some reason, after he looked at me, he just kept running back onto the main track, directly around the bend and out of sight. And for all I knew, continuing in his search. After a few seconds of his not returning, I broke out into a run in the other direction from where I first started, back underneath the bridge again towards my car. He looked at me. I remember going home that night, and uh, at some point... I went online. I uh, didn't know what I wanted to search for, really, and I ended up typing in the phrase eye contact. I found some research paper a group of Japanese scientists wrote on what happens when we make eye contact. First of all, our brain knows the difference between a real person's eye contact and someone's eyes looking at you say, on a computer screen. Eye contact activates the social part of your brain. It tells you that the other person is paying attention and helps you to empathize. Even just blinking can communicate a number of different emotions. Nothing I read in that article was a major surprise. I suppose it helped me put into words what I'd already been thinking. When someone looks at you, they see you don't they? After a few more articles on eye contact, I decided to search the words looking but not seeing. After not much luck, I expanded that to what happens when we look at something but our brains don't register it? Success. I found an interactive online study. I was assured the findings would be made known to me after I participated in this one minute survey. What the hell I thought. I was wide awake anyhow. I was instructed to watch a video and told that it would contain six people tossing a ball to each other around a circle. And it was my job to count how many times I saw the players wearing white catch the ball. I clicked begin and was shown some footage of three men and three women tossing a bright orange basketball around a circle. There was no option to pause or rewind the video, so I gave it my full attention. 
When the video finished, I was asked to report how many times I'd seen the ball tossed around the circle. I counted 25. After submitting my answer, I was told that 95% of people counted the ball being caught between 24 and 26 times. Feeling uh, quite proud of myself, I clicked the button to go on to the next page, expecting to get the complete answer. Instead, I was asked another question. It read, Around what count was the ball at when the man in a gorilla suit entered the circle? Perplexed, I leaned back in my chair. After a few seconds of not touching the mouse, the video automatically played again, this time fast-forwarding the first few seconds with a small counter in the corner. It slowed down around the 40-second mark, as, to my surprise, a man in a gorilla suit walked into the center of the circle and waved at the camera. Afterwards, he exited the circle and left the frame. I was dumbfounded. This had to have been a different video, I thought. Again, the next page loaded automatically, and it read, 90% of volunteer participants in this study argued that they were shown two different videos. As if it had read my mind. It then prompted me to reload the page and take the test again, if I didn't believe it. I took the test again. I had to understand. When the page reloaded, I didn't count the ball tosses this time. Instead, I looked intently at other details, trying to notice things out of the ordinary. What the men and women were wearing, how they threw the ball. The room they were in had white walls, and the carpet was a dull brown. And then, from out of nowhere, the gorilla man entered. Those that threw the ball paid him no attention. He walked right through the circle, planning his entrance so the ball wouldn't hit him, and waved right at the camera, his dark brown suit a similar color to the carpet. I couldn't believe it. The next moment, a prompt came up on the side of the page, and it said, Second time doing the test? Click here. I clicked, and I was on a page with all of the study's findings. The study showed that 97% of people who took this study missed the gorilla. The study proved that people can be blind to things right in front of them. It went on to say that adrenaline, extreme trauma, or concentration can cause us to miss details directly in front of our face. I often wonder, what would have happened to me that night running under the bridge? What would have happened if that man had actually stopped running, if he had slowed down to search for me? What would have happened if he'd found me? In the video I watched, I was too distracted counting the ball tosses to notice the gorilla, but earlier that night I would have sworn that man was looking for me. So why did he miss me? Was he looking for something else? It was at that point, sitting there online, when the search triggered something in me, a memory. On that particular Black Friday, I remembered the man Sean and Alice were laughing about. The man had been in the changing rooms for a good hour or so that evening. Looking away from my computer monitor, I replayed the final minutes of shutting down the store in my mind. Yes. He was there. I'd pulled the roller door down halfway and made my way back to the counter as Alice was serving the man. The man in the marathon singlet and orange cap had been in the store while we were closing, purchasing new tracksuit pants that he'd tried on for over an hour that evening. The last sale of the night. And in that moment, as I contemplated this, I knew he felt familiar. I could have sworn this was not his first visit to our shop. And my fear is it won't be his last.